النهارده ونوعدكم السيشن فعلا هتكون فيري انترستنج وهترك زميلي الدكتور تامر يقدم المتحدث التالي. Good morning everybody. Uh, we are proud to have Dr. Fawaz al-Rifai with us. Uh, Dr. Fawaz al-Rifai is the head of uh, gastroenterology unit in Adan Hospital, uh, Kuwait Ministry of Health, and uh, he will uh, present uh, for us nutrition in uh, short bowel syndromes. Uh, me, myself, I'm very proud to have uh, Dr. Fawaz with us as I worked uh, under his uh, supervision and guidance for almost uh, 20 years in Kuwait. Uh, he is the best uh, guidance ever. And uh, he had a big effort in uh, Kuwait Ministry of Health, uh, Kuwait uh, uh, KIMS, which is a Kuwaiti board. He had big effort in all kinds of uh, uh, publications and uh, lectures, uh, me, myself, and uh, so many others uh, took uh, a big uh, uh, chance to work with Dr. Fawaz. Thank you, Dr. Fawaz. Stage is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Tamer. Sabah al-khair al and shukran jazeelan al karima Professor Sana. I'm very happy to be here as a part of this Congress always. So my task over the next 20 minutes is to give you a flavor about nutrition and short bowel syndrome. This is very important and big topic, and it might take many hours to cover it, but I try to focus on the major nutritional points in management. So I'll start with the case and then give you a flavor about the definition, pathophysiology, and focus on some practical tips in management. So this is a female neonate. Uh, a product of full-term vaginal delivery, birth weight 2.48 kilos. Ante antenatal ultrasound showed meconium cyst and polyhydramnias, revealed intestinal obstruction. Soon after delivery, she was transferred to pediatric surgery hospital, and she was diagnosed to have ileal atresia with the meconium cyst. At the time of operation, they did laparotomy, excision of the meconium cyst with ileostomy at 90 centimeter from the DJ junction, and the ascending colon mucus fistula brought out through the main wound. She had enough bowel uh, remaining, more than 90 centimeter. Since discharge from Ibn Sina Hospital, which is the pediatric surgery hospital, she developed watery, loose motion, very frequent, up to eight or 10 times daily after taking high energy formula. Somebody there in the pediatric surgery, they give her high energy because they thought she's underweight. So she was taking 1.5 cal per mil. She presented to us in our hospital at the age of 19 days with severe dehydration. This is her picture when she came to us with you know significant drop in the weight, almost two kilos and other parameters as well. Otherwise, uh, you know, signs of dehydration were evident, definitely. Investigation at that time showed, uh, you know, a white count slightly elevated. Her CRP was negative. She had significant hyponatremic dehydration, elevated urea and creatinine as expected because of severe dehydration. And this BGA was done after correction with, uh, with normal saline. And she, she had metabolic acidosis prior to this. So at that time, we diagnosed her as pre-renal failure, secondary to hydration, and secondary to short bowel syndrome. So in the hospital, this patient stayed in the hospital for almost two and a half to three months. So she was managed by uh, intensive IV fluids, uh, total peritoneal nutrition, for at least six weeks at that time, and then weaned off till we get rid of it prior to discharge. She was given IV PPI, omoprazole at one to two milligram per kg per day, we give her anti-diarrheal agent, lopramide. We started with a small dose at 0.1, and then we titrate the dose to the best effect to decrease the stool output coming from ileostomy. She underwent a strict fluid balance and stoma output replacement. We are doing strict fluid balance every four hours, and we are replacing losses one-to-one -one with normal saline and KCL if needed. Anything beyond or exceed 40 ml per kg per day need to be replaced. Uh, she was managed with amino acid formula because breast milk was not available and the tolerance was excellent. Symptoms improved significantly and she started to gain weight and wean off her TPN. 
At the weight of five kilo, we transfer her back to close the stoma at the pediatric surgery hospital, and she came back to us to continue nutrition and rehabilitation. She was discharged in good clinical condition after three months, and we're still following her. Now she's seven years and doing very well, uh, you know, socially um, and physically. So she was given also bacterial overgrowth prophylaxis. This is the regimen that we use. I'm not telling this is right or wrong, but this is what we use in our practice. We give metronidazole of 10 milligram per kg per dose twice daily for two weeks, followed by amoxiclav of 15 milligram per kg per dose uh, twice daily for two weeks, and then we give them uh, one or two weeks of uh, you know, rest, and then we resume the cycle because these patients are high risk of bacterial overgrowth. So if we want to go back and just review the topic of short bowel syndrome in a nutshell. So short bowel syndrome is a functional definition. So it doesn't correspond with the actual residual remnant of the bowel. So it's more denoting the malabsorptive state that may occur after massive resection of the small intestine. And intestinal failure, you know, it's a big umbrella. So short bowel is one of the causes or one of the, you know, subtitles of intestinal failure. So intestinal failure, not including short bowel syndrome, but also can include pseudo-obstruction syndrome or, you know, congenital disorders of motility and many other diseases. So if you have a, a a state in which the GI function is inadequate to maintain the nutrient for absorption and you cannot maintain hydration status and growth and development, this is what we call intestinal failure. And if you want to focus on surgical causes of intestinal failure, which are the main causes of uh, short bowel syndrome, on the top of them is definitely necrotizing enterocolitis, followed by atresia, valvulus, gastroschisis, and fallocele, and rarely we have few cases of total colonic agangliosis of Hirschsprung disease. We have, you know, before going to the disease or, you know, pathophysiology of sharp bowel syndrome, we have to understand what is normal in uh, babies. And we have to know that the length of the bowel varies according to gestational age. If you are a baby of 24 or 26 weeks, length of the small bowel is much less than uh, being a term. For example, if you are, you know, uh, 24 or 26 weeks, the length of the small bowel is only 50 centimeter. This will increase to uh, probably 150 centimeter at term and then increase to adult later on, which is usually uh, 3.5 to 4 uh, meters. So, also, we have to understand and we have to remind us about the basic physiological functions of the small intestine. So motility, secretion, digestion, and absorption. And it's very important to remind us about the sites of absorption of different nutrients. So starting from didenum, where your calcium, magnesium, iron get absorbed, and the jejunum, the fat, protein, uh, carbohydrates, and the ileum, especially fat, uh, B12, bile salts, and colon with the fluid and the electrolytes. Main site of absorption of the fluid definitely is the small bowel, in which 90% of reabsorption of fluid is happening, and the colon responsible for about 10% of uh, absorption of fluid. And it's very important for us also to understand what is the concentration of electrolytes in different parts of the intestine, because this will, uh, you know, make the job of interpreting the fluid laws much easier. This child has ileostomy, and the sodium content and the uh, bicarb, in addition to the chloride, is quite a huge. So if you are losing a lot of fluid from ileostomy, you need to replace this with sodium chloride and uh, bicarb if needed. So we have to understand that, remind us, that the type and severity of clinical manifestation are highly dependent upon the physiology of the remaining small bowel. In some patients, energy and protein needs can be adequately met enterally, but vitamin and mineral deficiency still might happen, and you, you need to monitor this and supplement accordingly. In others, fluid and electrolyte losses are the predominant clinical problem, but nutrient absorption may be adequate, so it's quite variable. What about the factors contributing to the outcome? And there is many debate about this. It's not clear crystal, but there are a few uh, important factors to remember. Age at the time of injury, amount and site of remaining bowel, whether ileum was resected, jejunum, colon, all this is important to know. 
function and motility of the residual intestine. So it's not only the length. So we need to know the function. Is it dilated? Uh, there is a stasis. Is it, there is a chance of bacterial overgrowth. And also you have to avoid other long-term complications, which are uh, cholestatic liver disease related to long-term use of TPN, infection coming from central line, and further injury to remaining bowel. So I think we covered that, that the length of the intestine varies by gestational age. And also, you know, uh, if you have less bowel, then the site of absorption will be much less available. And also, you have to remember that gastric acid hypersecretion is very common after massive resection of the intestine. This is why we advise to give these children intravenous or oral proton pump inhibitor for three to six months after initial surgery to get rid of the excess uh, gastric acid secretion. What about, you know, the jejunum and the ileal resection? Which one is better uh, adaptation process? So the jejunal resection, you know, jejunum is a very important site for fluid, uh, uh, electrolyte absorption and fat, carbohydrate and protein. It has long lights, has large absorptive service and highly concentrated digestive enzymes and many transport carrier proteins. Thus, when the jejunum is resected, a temporary reduction in absorption of most nutrients happen. And following jejunal resection, Ilium adapt rapidly and to assume the jejunal function. This is very important point to remember that your ilium has much more adaptive function than the jejunum. So it's much, um, you know, it's much easier to have a jejunum resected than ilium resected. You will get into more problems if you get ilia resection. On the other hand, with ilium resection, so we have to remember that ilium is the primary site of absorption of vitamin B12 and bile acid. If you lose your ileum, so you get a, a chance of more osmotic diarrhea, like in this child, kind of shaded with high carbohydrate feeding, and also your chance of B12 deficiency is secretory diarrhea from unabsorbed bile acid and kidney stone from hyperxaluria. So many problems happen with ileal resection, and the chance of jejunum adaptation is much less with ileal resection. Uh, also, the lose of ileocecal valve is very important. This is why we advise to give... Uh, bacterial overgrowth prophylaxis for these children. So if you lose the ileocecal valve, this will lead to translocation of bacteria from uh, the colon to the small intestine and rapid transit time that might exacerbate uh, diarrhea and decrease sensitivity to osmotic load in the small bowel. What about lose of the colon? So if you lose your colon, you have chance of lose of colonic break, you lose the water and electrolyte absorption, you lose ability to self fetch calories from malabsorbed carbohydrate. So your colon is very important to be present as well. What about intestinal adaptation? We always talk about intestinal adaptation. So intestinal adaptation is a process that will take time after intestinal resection, and you need, there are many maneuvers and ways to accelerate intestinal adaptation. It's not only hyperplasia of the mucosal cells, but also it's muscular hypertrophy. What about the complication of TPN? I think we covered those already regarding you know the management so in the old early post operative stage you have to manage fluid and electrolyte very carefully you have to replace what's lost very carefully whether you have a jejunostomy or ileostomy you have to replace this every 2 to 4 hours with a strict fluid balance you have to give uh, gastric hyper secretion uh, you know antidotes which are h2 blockers uh, ppi in the first 6 months after resection and you have to control the area with anti motility drugs like lopramide which is safe to be used in these children but you have to titrate the dose to the best therapeutic response. Sometimes we give codeine if the child is not responding, or in some cases which are not responding, you can give octrotide uh, sub-Q or intravenously. And the key is to start enteral feeding, even a trophic amount of feeds early on, because this will stimulate the intestine to have intestinal adaptation as soon as possible. The goals of nutritional therapy is definitely to maintain adequate nutrition, to promote intestinal adaptation, and to avoid complications. So the enteral nutrients is very important to stimulate hyperplasia, to promote peristalsis, to decrease overgrowth, and to stimulate the flow of GI secretion and secretion of humoral factors. So, you know, this is always the question come to us. Should I give, you know, a trophic feeds, 10, 15 ml, three times daily, or should I give continuous feeds? And there is no right or wrong answer here, but usually in cases which uh, 
TPN tend to be used for a long time, and we prefer to give continuous feeding. This is uh, much more useful for the child for great tolerance, decreased chance of vomiting, decrease the chance of diarrhea, and also to uh, stimulate intestinal adaptation. So usually we give a small frequent feeds and we build up the dose over days. You have to look at the weight, you have to look at your urine sodium, the hydration status of the baby, and inc make increment slowly. These children need very meticulous uh, management. This is why we advocate to have a multidisciplinary team to manage these children in each hospital, including pediatric surgery, gastroenterologist, uh, dietitian, social worker, and everybody. And physically, we need to see these patients. I used to see these patients uh, every day, you know, in the morning and the uh, end of the day, just to make sure that we are not missing anything. These are, you know, a few points about the principle of feeding. So you have to quantify the feeding intolerance by stool output, hydration status, and then you have to build up and increase the dose. You have to remember these children need extra fluids. So you need to go up to 150 and up to 200 ml per kg per day. Uh, because they, their losses is huge. And you have to make increment slowly. You don't need to increase their fluid intake every day. Depending on the tolerance, I increase it every two to three days, usually by 10 to 15 ml per kg per day, slowly, till you reach at least 50% of your total intake from internal nutrition, then you can drop your uh, TPN slowly and accordingly, so this child can be advanced to internal autonomy. Regarding type of feeding, you know, the bottom line that these children do much better uh, from evidence-based uh, on breast milk or hydrolyzed formula, and specifically amino acid formula. Because, you know, with the standard formula, they have increased intestinal permeability, their half of chance uh, uh, of cow's milk protein intolerance or allergy is very high, so you don't want to lose time or, uh, you know, make this child lose fluids and have diarrhea. So usually we, we go with hydrolyzed formula or breast milk. Definitely breast milk is the best. We cannot say anything about that. It contains growth factors, uh, epidermal growth factors, induce protective uh, bifidogenic bacteria, and shorter duration to, of parenteral nutrition. This is the protein hydrolysate. So some people go with extensively hydrolyzed. Uh, we prefer usually in, in such cases to go straight away with amino acid uh, formula. And this is evident from many studies that children who are being started on amino acid formula as you know, initial feeding do much better. Uh, they have shorter duration of uh, PN dependence, and you know, uh, they tend to get rid of the PN early on, and they go quicker to uh, enteral autonomy. And usually, you know, complex carbohydrate is much better than simple carbohydrate. Simple carbohydrate will create osmotic load, lead to much more diarrhea. You need something to slow gastric emptying a little bit. And usually medium chain triglyceride is much better because you know you don't need lymphatic to be absorbed. So it, it gets directly into portal circulation. Uh, sometimes we use in these children, especially who are been staying on TPN for a long time, a preventive effect of SMOF lipids or omega van, which is fish oil based, rather than intralipids. Or, you know, some people combined omega van with intralipids, one gram of each, in order to avoid essential fatty acid deficiency and uh, protect the liver. What about the glutamine growth hormone? This has been tried in adult and uh, animal models, uh, inconclusive results, and we don't advocate the use of those uh, till now. However, if you look at the glucagon-like peptide, which is a deteglutide, this was licensed by FDA to be used in children since 2019 and used uh, once daily as a sub-Q injection and has very successful outcome in a small series of patients who are dependent on PN for a long time. So this is one of the weapons that you can use as a last resort in order for these children to wean off TPN or uh, at least to reduce the number of hours of TPN. Uh, and this is available nowadays and it's approved to be used in children from the age of one and above. Be careful, this will lead to mucosal proliferation. So you need to monitor these children for polyps in the colon. You need to do colonoscopy after one year of uh, treatment and monitor this. So the outcome, so better outcome with breast milk, amino acid based formula, percentage of calories taking entirely by six weeks of life and residual small bowel. These are very important factors to keep in mind. 
So in summary, the principles of management to advance enteral nutrition slowly, but in a determined fashion, just be patient. Don't rush in these patients. This patient will take some time for intestinal adaptation to happen. Recognize complication early on and try to protect the liver and the line and to avoid serious uh, life-threatening event. And patients with short bowel should be assessed for likelihood of resuming oral diet because these children, they forget how to eat by mouth. So you need to stimulate them even, you know, by suck and swallow mechanism early on to avoid oral aversion later on. Early management, uh, focus on fluid and electrolyte replacement. Enteral feeding should begin once the patient stabilizes, i.e. as soon as possible. If the child doesn't have ileus, doesn't have perforation or intensive vomiting, start trophic feeds early on. Continuous enteral feeding is preferred initially, and then you can transfer to bolus feeding, which is more physiological. A breast milk or amino acid formula definitely will be your uh, choice in this patient. Several pharmacological approach have been tested in effort to enhance intestinal adaptation and to improve feeding. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fawaz, for such a comprehensive presentation. حالة very interesting بتكمل النشاط العلمي الأول جلسة في اليوم الثالث في مؤتمرنا الحقيقة ده لس يعني more or less حاجة احنا متوقعينها من دكتور فواز وأنا بكمل شهادة الدكتور تامر إن أنا الحقيقة طول فترة وجودي في الكويت أنا اشتغلت في اليونت مع دكتور فواز وهو الحقيقة مثال فعلا للديديكيشن في شغله سواء للبيشنس أو لتعليم الأصغر والحقيقة روحه الجميلة وهو very social وما شاء الله من الأسر الرفاعي أكبر أسر في الكويت رحمة الله على الوالد هو له أيادي بيضاء على النظام الطبي في الكويت كلها احنا شرفنا بوجود حضرتك يا دكتور فواز شكرا جزيلا شرفنا شكرا أنا هترك تقديم المتحدث التالي